So this is the um, this is the courthouse in the town of uh, Pioche, Nevada. It's about 180 miles north of Las Vegas, and I guess everything in Nevada is north of Las Vegas. Um, but in this stage, in this kind of uh, lead up to Halloween, we're going to have our Halloween edition of uh, of, of 40 minutes of confidence and and the formula we're going to kind of look at right now is that violence times time equals fun <laughs> what do I mean by that well I mean all these things that were just really violent and really horrible over time they kind of become they kind of become Halloween costumes so if we're talking about uh, if we're talking about a witch, you know, witches were burned at the stake. This was like horrible stuff. Um, pirates were just the worst people and not like our might and matey way. They were just really, really violent people and murderous people. The Wild West was this awful time. Um, and to that end, I mean, violence now, you know, you have about a two, well, in the US, you have about a five in 100,000 chance, five in 100,000 chance of your life ending in some violent act, including war and murder, homicide. Um, but in uh, historically, um, your chances of dying from violence were about 250,000 out of 100,000. So it's about one out of four. That's why we're so uh, um, uh, genetically inclined to believe or be worried about any kind of violence, even though it's highly unlikely that, that we're, we ourselves are gonna be murdered uh, despite what you might think of if you looked at your podcast feed. So, um, uh, but even though that was historical, um, uh, sometimes it was as much in the Wild West in a town like this, it was as much as 750,000 per 100,000 people died of violence. Um, and indeed, the, um, the person who ran the cemetery in P.O. said that there were 75 people who were murdered before the first person died of natural causes. 60% of homicides reported in 1871 and 1872 were reported of all of, all of Nevada. 60% of homicides were reported uh, in Pioche. And so it was in that world that they decided to build a courthouse and Pioche became the county seat and they wanted to build what would later become this courthouse that you're seeing right now. And um, so they contracted, and as you can imagine, in this kind of frontier town, this lawless frontier town, they didn't have a lot of choices when it came to reputable contractors. So they wound up hiring a guy named Edward Donahoe, and, and he was to build the courthouse. And then uh, they were going to pay him $16,400. And then um, uh, his associate um, was a guy named John Steele. No E on that. And he was paid an additional ten thousand dollars, and um, they were to and and he was going to be building the jail that was behind the courthouse, which you can imagine in that particular society in that particular era was quite important. Well, no surprise there. There was all kinds of cost overruns. There were cost overruns from design alterations. There were cost overruns from poor management. There were cost overruns from construction mistakes. But mostly, there was. Uh, cost overruns from graft, from just straight up people stealing money from corruption. And so before it was all over, instead of paying about $26,400, they paid, the, the county paid over $75,000 for it. Now, to, to, um, to raise the $16,400 to pay Donahue and the $10,000 to pay Steele, they issued what are called scripts, what now would be called bonds. Um, so basically, they're just borrowing from people. So they're issuing IOU and they pay interest on that. And they paid an unusually high interest rate because nobody wanted to invest because everyone thought this project was doomed. So they had to pay an unusually high interest rate at the beginning. And sure enough, uh, they ran out of money. And uh, they ran out of money in part because the cost overruns, but also the tax revenues dried up because in the boom and bust cycle of mining towns, there was a bust around the time that construction started. So there are no more tax revenues. So then they issued more of these scripts, more of these bonds, which are essentially loans, IOUs to people at even higher interest rates. And uh, the interest rates were so high and the borrowing was so significant that they didn't pay off the, they didn't pay off this building 
until 1938. Um, and that was two years after the building was condemned uh, for, it, uh, for its deterioration. It was no longer inhabitable. So what does that amount to? Well, I don't, I don't know how many millions now, but at the time in 1938, they wound up paying, including all the interest they paid over those years from 1871 to 1938, they wound up paying $800,000 for this building, um, which is many millions or many tens of millions. Maybe one of you guys wants to go online and look that up, but what is $800,000 in 1905 money? You know, pick some spot in the middle between 1871 and 1938. And $800,000, you know, what would that be worth now? But it's got to be millions, millions, maybe tens of millions. Anyhow, um, that's basically what we're trying to avoid. So all that we're looking at, all these, all these names are basically a big fancy way of saying, we're going to set up a game. It's a game with very strict rules. And this game with very strict rules is going to try to get everyone what they want. Now, what does everyone want? Well, everyone wants everything, but most of all, if you ask the contractor what the contractor wants, she's going to say she knows that the bid price will often be the deciding factor as to whether or not she's going to land the contract. Um, so she may have to bid under the cost of the job and then pad her revenue with change orders later to make a profit or just to break even uh, just so she can get the job. So her, her main goal is to get the job. She also wants clarity in the drawing. She wants drawings that she can read and that actually makes sense from a construction point of view. And she wants a fast turnaround on decisions. So RFIs or applications for payments or submittal approvals. She wants to stay on schedule. Now, what does the owner want? Well, he wants the lowest bid price and no change orders. So you already see the owner's interest is a little bit contract, contrary to the contractor's interests. And he wants the earliest possible project completion. They kind of both want that. Now the, now, the owner, the developer, he loves negotiating opaque contracts because he wins most negotiations because he has more lawyers. So you, you're the architecture firm, and you also want to win the job, period. You just want to win the job, um, in part because you want to make money. But if you're like most of us, it's because you really want to make a great building. Um, and, and you may underbid to get the contract, and then you may see no path to profitability, and that's a big problem. Um, and you have the least risk of the three and you're the least likely comfortable with the race risk in part because you're the least insured for the risk um, and you the architect want to be want to be in control of most of the small and medium-sized decisions and you want the contractor to build exactly what's drawn so these are kind of the primary interests of each of these three players and so the contracts are set up to do that uh, more or less. This whole process is kind of set up so each of those three parties is most likely to get each of those things they want. Now, all three parties also typically want a high quality building, although the, how they define the high quality building is going to be very different from one to the other. Now, we know that we're the right ones. Uh, we want the high quality building because we're the only ones who actually see the building as having an interest. Um, but the owners and the contractor want a high quality building as well, generally. So within that, we have these terms that we need to figure out what they mean within this really complicated, very strict game uh, that involves all the, the rules for getting a building built. There are, these, there are these words, this jargon, and like any profession, the jargon is in part aimed at keeping people who don't know what they're doing out, or at least allowing us to identify uh, outsiders, out groups, uh, but also because we have some very subtle differences. And that's why some of these words seem kind of similar. So we need to know what bidding requirements mean, instructions to bidders, bidding documents, contract forms, the conditions of the contract, general conditions, supplementary conditions, performance bond, payment bond, bid bond, specifications, the project manual, master spec, unit format, contract documents, contract drawings, addenda, bulletin, contract drawings, resource drawings, and instruments of service. Let's get started. All right, now, the first two we're gonna talk about are bidding requirements and instruction, instructor, instructions to bidders. So as part of this process, the owner wants the lowest possible price. And the best way to do that is to put the project out to bid for you, the architect, to draw the project, then put that project out to bid. And then the folks in, um, in construction are gonna see that you put it out to bid and they're gonna uh, put a bid package together to, um, I'm sorry, they're gonna put a bid together 
to, um, uh, uh, to establish a fixed price for the owner. That's what the owner wants. So the bidding, the, the bidding requirements are all of these things. It's the bid solicitation. So that's the, used to be in the newspaper. These days it's more often going to be digital, but it's some kind of announcement saying we are soliciting bids to build this particular natatorium or firehouse or dormitory. Um, and, um, and you are welcome to join in that solicitation as a contractor. Now you, the architect, part of your job is to assist the owner through this bid process. So to help um, the owner put out the bid solicitation. There are instructions to bidders um, and instructions to bidders, um, not surprisingly for almost all of these, there's an AIA document for that. It's like the original app. Um, there's an AIA document for that, that's A701. And, it has things like the name of the owner and the architect and definitions and the business representatives and the bidding documents and so forth. Um, and so what you're gonna do is you're gonna kind of say, okay, we have instructions to bidders. You need to, um, uh, you need to have your bid in by this time. Very strict about the time, can't be flexible on the time because then another bidder can come in later and underbid all the other bidders. So it only works if you're very strict about all the rules and very strict about the time. And so those rules in that time are gonna be included in the instructions to bidders. And then information available to bidders is information that's relevant to the project, but not in the bid, not in, not in the contract. So I'll give you an example, like um, let's say you're a, a campus, a university campus, and you have suppliers that you work with, you have vendors that have been pre-approved because you're a state agency and you have like a particular person who provides the services of closing the roads on campus for construction jobs and other reasons, maybe football games, whatever. So you have a vendor that you work with that, that knows all the roads and knows, you know, has all the signs and storage and you wanna make sure they work with you as a client, you as the university, wanna make sure that the, only the people who are from this firm are gonna be closing roads for your construction. Now that may or may not have shown up somewhere in the contract you as the owner may not even be aware of that. So you may put instruction to bidders, look, um, there are certain people who are gonna have to be used for certain procurement. Um, here's a list of them and know that you're still, even if those people can't do the job, you're still responsible for doing whatever's needed in the contract, but these are the people you need to hire. That may not be in the contract. That may be something that just goes out standard as instruction to bidders for, for every bidder that, that deals with that particular campus because they've been burned a few times and they wanna get ahead of that. All right, and then bid forms and supplements. So there's actual um, bid forms as well. All right, and all of those together are the, bidding, are the bidding requirements. All right, now, next we have the contract forms and the contract forms are the actual contract itself. It's the agreement and the agreement is between the architect and the, um, and the contractor in this case. It's AIA document A101. It's an important one for you to know. Many of you have already been studying it, but for those of you who are new to this process, um, you may not know about this. And in that agreement, it looks something like this and it has all the specifics. Um, so it has the name and legal status of the owner and it has the name of the contractor and it has the name of the project. And this is like an eight page document. It has, um, uh, it has uh, the date of commencement, the contract sum, the payments. So it's all about the who and the what and the where and the how much, how expensive, uh, how you're gonna do dispute resolution, whether you're gonna do mediation followed by um, trial or you're gonna be uh, mediation followed by arbitration. Those are your two choices there. How you're gonna handle termination or suspension, um, miscellaneous provisions and so forth. Um, so uh, the, that's the agreement. Then we have these bonds. And uh, you know, I mentioned bonds before, um, um, uh, but before I was talking about bonds like a loan. So if a building is gonna be built and it's expensive, say it's a, a $100 million addition to an airport. Well, no bank is gonna lend anyone $100 million because if that project defaults, then the bank is out of business. So you can't go get a loan at a bank. So if you have a big project, especially a public project, but even private projects all the time, they're going to issue bonds. And what a bond is, is it's just like the scripts that I talked to you about uh, 150 years ago in Nevada. It's a, an IOU with interest. So 
uh, it's kind of like a cross between a loan and a, you know, a mortgage and a stock. So I'm going to issue bonds uh, out and those bonds, you, you as an investor can buy those bonds and me as a municipality can, um, you will give me the municipality the money for the bond. I will use that money to build an airport and I will use tax revenues from the uh, fees that we charge the airlines over the years to pay, to, to pay you back over a long period of time. And every bond has a different, uh, different kind of, um, uh, uh, different kind of repayment structure, and that's how buildings get built. Now, this kind of bond is completely different. Um, the, these are called surety bonds, and they include performance bonds, payment bonds, and we'll just cross this off and put bid bond, bid bonds. Now, um, now, now, what are they? Well, in this scenario, a bond is has, has kind of a totally different meaning. Whereas before a bond was like a mortgage or a stock somewhere in between or a hybrid of the two, in this case, a bond is, a, um, is an insurance contract. So you're saying, okay, uh, I have a, uh, uh, you're, you're, you the contractor, or let's name the contractor. Let's say the contractor's name is Edward Donahue. So Edward Donahue, the contractor is going to pay a third party, we'll call it um, uh, nationwide insurance, right? It's basically an insurance company. And that third company is going gonna, is gonna to take Edward Donahue, the contractor's money, and then going to issue a document, which is called a bond, that basically says that if Edward flakes out, then we will cover him. We will, we will, we will pay the owner for the trouble of, that's caused by Edward backing out. So a performance bond is a guarantee uh, that the contractor paid the insurance company for and the insurance company is then guaranteeing that if the uh, contractor flakes out and leaves in the middle of the project, this insurance company will pay out the owner to finish the project. So if you leave halfway through, if Edward leaves halfway through and skips out of Nevada, um, this performance bond will cover that and will will provide make the owner make the county of Dickinson County whole for their PO uh, uh, building. It'll cover the cost of finishing it. That's called a performance bond. And many, maybe even most, um, uh, um, projects, especially big ones, require that the contractor uh, issue, uh, uh, submit a performance bond. So submit proof that they got an insurance policy that's gonna cover them if they flake out halfway through. A payment bond is similar. It's also like a third party insurance uh, that's gonna pay out all of the contractors, subcontractors in case the contractor flakes out. So sometimes the contractor will take on a job that, that puts him out of business because it, it bankrupts him. He didn't bid it correctly and or he missed something in the bid. Um, he missed something in the design while he was bidding and now he's broke. He might've finished the project, might not have, but he might not have paid his subcontractors. So some his subcontractors then can file a lien on the property to get paid. So now the airport is built and the subcon, you know, the, the, the plaster subcontractor can put a lien on the airport and say, basically, airport, you are not allowed. I own you. I own you airport until you pay me, which is crazy because the airport may have already paid the contractor but it's a worthwhile law to protect the little guy. So now the little guy, the contractor, I'm sorry, the subcontractor hasn't been paid by the contractor. And so the subcontractor goes straight to the owner and says, I wasn't paid by the subcontractor, pay up. Now the subcontractor gets their money from the owner and the owner is really pissed off because he paid the contractor already and she left town. Uh, well, I guess I was using Edward before. So he left town and, um, and Edward uh, left town. And so now the owner is stuck paying the subcontractors for work that the owner already paid for. So uh, the payment bond is the third party insurance that's gonna pay the subcontractors if the owner flakes out. And finally, we have bid bonds. And in bid bonds, um, maybe, the, um, uh, maybe the contractor, Edward, bid on the airport because uh, he thought he bid on the airport based on a whole bunch of things, but he didn't realize that one of the roads that had to be built needed to be elevated. There's something about, you know, the, something gets underneath, deliveries come underneath, and he just misread it and didn't realize one of the roads is elevated. Well, now Edward won the bid, but he realizes that the road is, has to be elevated. There is no way that Edward can make money 
on this project. In fact, if Edward takes on this, pro uh, this, this um, project at the amount that he swore he would do, the amount that he claimed he would do, he would build it for, if he takes on this project, he's gonna bankrupt himself and not be able to finish the project anyway. So Edward then is gonna walk even before the project starts. Now there's a significant amount of hassle and money and time lost in the bidding process. And the owner does not want to start the whole process again. So the owner will the, so the owner will require that all the bidders uh, submit a bid bond. Again, it's a third party that says, in this case, it says, um, if Edward walks off the job before he even signs the contract, then Nationwide Insurance is going to pay the difference between what Edward bid and the next highest bidder. So it's still going to cost the owner the same amount of money as the lowest bid. And the difference between Edward's bid and the next highest is gonna be covered by the insurance company. So anyhow, that's what a bid bond is. Now, we have conditions of the contract. So conditions of the contract include the general conditions and the supplementary conditions. Now the general conditions and supplementary conditions are like the rules on the inside of the board game. So whereas the agreement, which is A101, the agreement is a, a AIA document A101. That has the specifics of our building. What are we gonna choose to do? Are we gonna choose to go to mediation and arbitration? Or are we gonna choose to go to mediation followed by a trial, followed by, followed by the courts? Um, are we gonna pay uh, all at once? As a, are we gonna pay as a lump sum? Or are we gonna pay as cost plus fixed fee? You know, whatever it is. So the details are covered in the agreement, the A101. The general conditions is another AIA document, another one you need to know, and it's uh, the AI is the AIA document A two hundred one. The general conditions uh, look something like this, and they're longer. So, as the agreement is maybe eight pages or something, ten pages, the general conditions is approaching forty pages, and it has. Uh, information about the contractor and the architect and all the rules of the game, the amount of time and payments and completion. And generally, the general conditions are not going to be project specific. The idea is, at least in theory, the general conditions are the inside of the, the box of the board game. They're the rules and we have to follow them regardless of who's playing. And they may, um, uh, they may establish what happens if you find asbestos when you're doing the renovation? Like, what are the rules for that? Or they may establish um, how long the architect has to turn around the RFI or something like that. So um, that's the general conditions. And then there are supplementary conditions. And supplementary conditions, um, oh, here's the general conditions again, sorry. No, oh, here's, here's some of the general conditions. There's Article 5 is on sub subcontractors. Um, and uh, it defines what a subcontractor is. And then it award, it says um, uh, award of subcontractor and other contracts for portion of work. It says, unless otherwise stated, the contract documents the contractor as soon as practicable after award of the contract shall notify the owner and architect of the persons or enti entities proposed. Anyhow, it goes on to basically say that you, the contractor who won the bid, with a reasonable amount of time, you have, to, you have to give me a list of your important subcontractors because if one of them is, has a bad reputation, is difficult to work with, or is in the mafia, or has a reputation of flaking out on the job, or, or uh, has a reputation of not being financially sound, um, and we're afraid they're gonna go bankrupt, we can say, we want you to get a different subcontractor. And of course, then you can go back and say, he, you, the contractor can go and say, okay, I found a different subcontractor, but it's going to be more expensive. And then the owner can say, oh, I don't want to pay for that. Or the owner can say, sounds good. Anyhow, there's a million little rules like this. And those are the general conditions. Now, aside from the general conditions, there are some specific ones that may creep up often, but not often enough to show up all the time or are flexible, I guess more, more appropriately, are flexible enough that they're going to be more site specific. So these are the these are the rules for the board game that kind of are for this specific day in this specific board game. And there's a document for this too. There are the supplementary conditions, including amendments to AI document 201 and the owner contractor agreements. That's AIA 101 in design bid build. And this is AIA document A503. And it has all kinds of stuff about contract sum and payments and termination. Basically, 
things that you can change from the normal rules. So you may see that um, if the owner and contractor agree to a flat termination fee, the following model language may be used. And it gives examples of model language that you can put in your contract. So you wanna say the termination fee shall be some dollars. That may be a way to do it. Or you can say the termination shall, fee shall be some percent um, and so forth. So it's whatever, it kind of gives you some multiple choice or some ways to dress up the general conditions in a way that makes more sense to you or to the owner. But because there's a form, an AIA form, it means it's an established, that means someone's looked over it and made sure that probably the architect is less likely to get screwed by all the lawyers that the, uh, that the, that the uh, owner has. Uh, and it also means that it's a language that's probably held up in court and there's a, a long history of case law to kind of support it. All right, now let's get on to some other, uh, some other um, words, other terms that we need to study. Specifications. Specifications are just what you think they are. They are the fine print of the design. So you may draw a window, um, but the specif specifications may indicate what the maximum allowed infiltration is for that window. Um, you may draw a railing, but the specifications may identify uh, the, that the railing needs to be able to handle so many, you know, so much, so much torque or, or so much weight leaning on it. Um, you may uh, draw the, I'm just looking around at the window right now. Uh, you may uh, draw the pizza oven. Um, actually, have, there's a really delicious pizza place across the street that's like my downfall. Uh, you may draw the pizza oven, um, but the specifications will indicate um, uh, what, the, uh, what the oven's uh, specs need to be, like how big it needs to be and what temperature it needs to get up to or what brand it needs to be and so forth. So those are the specifications. And, um, and the specifications with the conditions of the contract, that's our rules, rules of all the construction projects, and uh, the contract forms, and the bidding requirements. So it's basically everything that you make that leaves your office that can easily be printed out on eight and a half by 11. All of that together is called the project manual. So the project manual is the specs, plus all the paperwork for the contract, plus the paperwork for bidding. That's called the project manual. Now, what are master spec and uniform at? All right, now master spec is, a master spec and uniform at are two competing ways of, um, of describing the, um, of describing the uh, uh, specs, because the, uh, the, the contractor and his subcontractors needs to be able to go through and both during bidding and during construction has to have some kind of a consistent Dewey Decimal System. And we've talked about this in previous uh, 40 Minutes of Competence meetings. Um, and if it seems like there's a lot of repetition in pro practice, that's because there's a lot of repetition in pro practice. So um, there are uh, uh, 600 questions on the exam Approximately 300 of them, way too many, are on pro practice. Approximately 300 of them, uh, not enough, are in technical competence side, kind of building science and, and construction materials and methods and maybe codes. Um, and so you think, okay, it's 50-50, but to get these 300 questions, there are, um, there are 1,000 concepts you have to learn. Um, so if you don't remember them all, it's probably okay, but you have a lot of time spent on those 300 questions. To get the 300 pro practice questions, there may be 100 concepts you have to learn. And then each of those 100 concepts is asked an average of three times each during the test. So if it seems like I'm repeating myself, it's because you really need to know just a few things. <laughs> and these are them. So anyhow, master spec is a um, uh, is a um, is a uh, basically a table of contents that divides up the specs so that the people who are um, uh, putting in a valve know where the valves are, where the specs on the valves are, and the people who are uh, putting in the electric lighting knows where that is, and the people who are the masons know where to look to find out all the specs for the mortar they need to use, and so forth, and um, and the, and that particular. Uh, that particular part of the of the game, the specifications, um, there are two different established um, uh, formats for 
formats for uh, organizing them. It's kind of like the Dewey Decimal System, only there are two of them. Um, and so one is master spec, that's the one supported by AIA. And master spec divides, divides up the specs and the table of contents by material generally. So um, there's going to be uh, one on concrete and a chapter on masonry and a chapter on metals and so forth. Um, and that's one way to do it. And that has traditionally been the dominant way. More and more with BIM, uh, people are starting to move a little bit more towards Uniformat, which is an ASDM sponsored um, standard. And that's more on systems. So there's substructure and then shell and interiors and services and so forth. So master spec and Uniformat are two competing, um, two competing uh, flavors of uh, organizational systems for the specs. Master spec is more about materials and is uh, traditionally been more associated with everything that came before BIM. <laughs> Uniformat is more about systems and is uh, more associated with BIM. All right, now the contract documents, what are they? The contract documents are everything that's in the contract. So everything after bidding that the architect has made for the, um, the architect and I guess the owner, including those contracts, has made that says basically these this is our agreement so the agreement is for the the uh, the agreement is for the contract documents um, the agreement for the contract documents is is that they uh, that the owner will have to build everything in the contract contract drawings so all the drawings that you made so everything that you used to think was all of architecture was just the drawings before we got into this other mess plus all of the specs, which is a fine print of the uh, of the building, that, that's a big old book and it may be a thousand pages easily. Um, and then plus the conditions of the contract, which are the rules, plus the contract forms, which are actually the agreement and the bonds and stuff. So all that together is the contract documents. The contract drawings, as we mentioned, are your final set of blueprints. Your, you know, your CD set that goes out um, and, and more or less gets bid. Now, there are, um, of course, during the process, sometimes it can, always it goes out to get bid and then there's, uh, um, there are changes that have to be made. Um, some of the changes will show up during the bidding process, oftentimes because bidders will ask a question like, you don't specify whether this metal roof is a 5V metal roof or standing C metal roof. And you say, oh, shoot. I guess I didn't specify that. So you'll issue an addenda and, 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 and uh, sorry, an addendum. And an addendum is just a change to the drawings after the bidding process began and before the bidding process end, it ends. And I think we're gonna redraw this drawing so that the addenda ends here. Now, any change that's made in the addenda, you still have to, the contractor still has to make that change. So it becomes part of the contract documents, but if it happens after the, uh, if it happens, uh, if a change happens after the bid, then it's a pretty big difference. It's called a, well, I have it here as modifications, but we're gonna call it a bulletin. It's more likely what it's called in the US. Um, so uh, this is an addenda or an addendum or addenda in plural. And this is a bulletin. And the addenda are changes after bidding began, but before the contract is signed. So there are changes that are built into the price. And remember what the owner really wants is a fixed price. She wants a fixed price. And what Edward Donahoe wants is, um, he wants to often to, to run, up the, run up the score on change orders. So any bulletin that requires a change in the contract in terms of money changing hands or scope of the work or um, the schedule of the work is a bulletin. And those are both addenda and bulletin have clouds around them. I think addenda usually has like a, a little triangle with a letter in it, I think. And, and, um, and bulletins are with numbers. If I got that wrong, someone put that in the chat. And actually the firm I used to work for uh, in Philadelphia, um, they, uh, uh, they called addend they called them addendums all the way through. So go ahead and in the chat, let me know if you call them modifications, bulletins, addenda, addendum, what you'd call it in your firm. 
so that I can, uh, I can establish a consensus in terms of my language. But as far as the contracts are concerned, and as far as the um, uh, ARE is concerned, if it happens after the addendum, it's a bulletin and it may require a, a change order. If it happens before the bidding uh, uh, ends, but after it starts, it's an addendum. All right, so that's the addenda and the bulletin. Now we have two more elements. One are the resource drawings and one's the instrument of service. Now the resource drawings, um, the resource drawings are um, drawings that are not part of the contract. Now, why the hell would there be drawings that are not part of the contract? The drawings that are not part of the contract, maybe the owner has multiple contracts. So the owner has hired you to build the, fit out the interior, but the owner has hired Edward Donahue to do the exterior shell, to do the kind of a corn shell stuff. So you can imagine that the, um, that outside of your contract documents as the interior person, there are some drawings that you really should be aware of <laughs> that are part of the core and shell so that you can understand what the exterior of the building looks like, even though you're only responsible for the interior of the building. So resource document, resource drawings are drawings that are related to your project, but are not part of the contract uh, for your, your part of the contract. Or it could be, um, uh, as built for a building you're renovating. So they're not part of your contract, but they're, they're really important for you to understand what you are to do if you were the contractor. And then um, uh, uh, the, the uh, bidding documents um, are everything. They're the resource drawings, the contract drawings, the specs, all the, the nonsense associated with the contracts themselves and all this stuff associated with the bidding and the addenda and the, and the, um, and the um, modifications, which we're calling bulletins, all of that together are called the bidding documents. Now there's one other, it's not on here, but we're gonna add it. It just isn't ready yet. Um, there's one other kind of uh, element that ought to be on here too. And that are the, uh, the, um, uh, the things that you might have used to make the, <laughs> make the project, but things that never left the office. So they may be, uh, we can, we'll put another, another kind of layer under here. And that layer may be things like abandoned ideas that you drew or sketched out, but you didn't wind up even showing to the client. Uh, or maybe you showed it to the client, but the client declined it and thought it was a bad idea. And so you, you, it wasn't part of the bidding documents or the contract or the specs or the, or the, or the um, contract drawings or anything like that. Um, it may include your sketchbook uh, for your ideas that you've sketched out over the time for details and that kind of thing. It may include study models you built or photographs you took of the block or all that other stuff. And all of that combined, all of this are called instruments of service. Now, do you need to memorize all of these? Eh, most of them. Um, will it be a big deal if you get one of them confused? Probably not if you remember the rules. So if you kind of remember that it's all about change orders and you, know, and you have a multiple choice question, you're likely to be able to figure it out by process of elimination. So I don't recommend that you necessarily memorize every one of these words, but I highly recommend that you be able to recognize every one of these words, even if you can't recall them. You should know kind of bid bond. Oh, that's one of the insurance ones. Which one is that? Oh, let's see if I can figure it out by the context in the question. And I guess a bid bond would make sense if that's the insurance for the, um, for the bid <laughs> to cover the uh, difference between the lowest bid and the next lowest bid if the contractor flakes out um, when she realizes that she has an elevated road that she thought was on the ground. All right. For next week's 40 minutes of competence, um, this is the question, what type of power delivery is this circuit? And of course it's the yellow arrow arrow. So what type of power delivery is described by that circuit? And by that, I mean, um, I'm talking about voltage and phase and, and wires and that kind of thing, number of wires. Uh, those of you who are uh, familiar with the Amber book know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, for some of the rest of you, it may be a little bit fuzzy, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about it together next week. 
All right. Now, I did not put the, the question from last week. I didn't accidentally fail to put it on this slide, uh, but I'll read it to you. The question from last week, week when we were talking about solar heat gain coefficients, so we were talking about um, a building and we were talking in our case about a skylight, but let's make it a south-facing window to answer this question. So we have a south-facing window um, and we're looking at this in section. So here's my person and we have the sun and that sun, sunlight with its corresponding heat is gonna be entering into the building. Now, the question is, does this solution mean we have to increase winter heating? And I think I understand what this person is asking. So we were talking last week about low E coatings and low solar heat gain coefficients being advantageous, and they generally are. The exception is if you have a, at least in theory, if you have a south facing window and that south facing window is in a cold climate and you wanna treat this like a direct gain space where you wanna have thermal mass that uh, moderates the swings in temperature and provides a thermal lag. And assuming that you have sealed up everything and made it airtight and you've insulated everything, if you do all that, then um, you may want a higher solar heat, heat gain coefficient. You want a higher number in the solar heat gain coefficient category to allow more of the sun's radiant energy in. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's because you weren't there last week, you can go back to the um, uh, to the uh, unlisted YouTube um, channel uh, that we put out in our announcement. And if you don't know what that is, you can email firms at, 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 at uh, amber-book.com and Tyler will get all that for you. But anyhow, um, um, uh, uh, so if you have south facing glass, you may want the heat and you have a cold sunny climate and you have a small building. These are a bunch of ifs. You would think the ARE and frankly, the Academy and uh, frankly, a lot of architects think that it's common to want to bring in heat on, with south facing glass. In reality, it only makes sense if it's well insulated, if there's thermal mass like concrete inside, if it's south facing, if it's shaded, if it's airtight, if the whole assembly is fairly airtight and if it's in a sunny cold climate. If all of those boxes are checked, then you do want to bring in um, uh, 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 sunshine, the heat from sunshine. And if you do, you don't want to reflect too much of that heat. You actually want to let it go through. So whereas a, um, a low E glass might be a solar heat gain coefficient of uh, 0 0.4, um, if there's no low E, it may be something more like 0 0.8, and that would be more appropriate uh, solar heat gain coefficient for a, um, for a, a passive thermal strategy. All right, who else? Michael, I had a quick question about uh, the conditions of contract. Um, just in terms of like for the, the A503, the supplemental items, is that something like say I was beginning, I was just starting a firm and I was, this is my first project that I'm doing and I'm, I'm going over my supplementary conditions. Is this something that architects typically do with a lawyer or it's just, you just understand your project and your site and your client very well, and you're filling it out, your flavors based on, uh, I guess, what's specific to you and that, and that project, and you just promote. A lawyer. I mean, oh. you know, you can imagine a scenario where it's a residential, it's a residence, it's someone's relative, and you're just going by the, ander, the standard vanilla AIA contract with no changes, you can definitely get away with doing it without a lawyer. Um, Believe it or not, 50% of projects architects work on have no contract. Let me repeat, 50% of projects that architects work on have no contract. Um, and that's not good, but that's, it's not. So, so there's two different questions. What should you do or what happens in reality? What happens in reality is sometimes owners like there not to be a contract and we'll just be like, ah, don't worry about it. We'll be fine without a contract because the owner wants to be able to come back later and say, um, you know, you really, uh, this, you know, this, this roof is leaking and you really should, you know, uh, you really should uh, back up your work. And you say, well, no, I don't have to back up my work. I, you know, and they say, well, we don't have a contract. So that says that a statute of limitations has expired or statute of repose. Um, so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go ahead and see you later. So, um, uh, uh, but yes, and as far as the ARE is concerned, 
um, you should get a lawyer. And and honestly, most of an even if mo even if half of projects don't have a contract, all the big ones do. And if you kind of ask yourself, how many how much time do I spend on big projects versus little projects? For most of you, it's going to be you know 100% to 0%. So I have found that you know while there are many architects that do residential. Um, most architecture time, most architecture dollars, most architects design square feet, uh, and most architects man hours is spent on big projects and all of those would or at least should have a contract with lawyers. The problem is that the owners spend all their time looking at these contracts and the architects have better things to do. And so you're not on a level playing field when you're negotiating with the owner and that's why you want to use you want to use something really standard and hold your ground when they start to negotiate. Say no, 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 we're just going to go vanilla on this contract. Um, if you have a problem with it, that's fine. But you know you can walk. But I'm not taking this project unless you go in vanilla because unless it's an owner that you trust, which is actually a big deal from a risk ma risk management point of view. Having an owner that you know and trust is a bigger deal than you would think because there's always a way around contracts, right? You can. You can still see, you know, you can still cost someone a lot of money in court fees and legal fees by suing them, even if the contract says that you can't. Uh, you still have to lawyer up. So, um, uh, uh, having someone that you is experienced and has a reputation as an owner of paying up and not suing their architects and not suing their contractors, that is a really big deal when it comes to uh, those kind of questions. But as far as the ARE is concerned, and I'm certainly not a lawyer, so take it all with a grain of salt, but um, you should definitely have a lawyer or a team of lawyers. All right, good night, get licensed.